So you have a blockchain, which is a chain of blocks. And each one of these blocks stores information. So how does the blockchain add another block? And how do you make sure the blockchain adds the right information? Consensus does exactly that. And the definition of consensus is literally a general agreement. Now, I'm going to be saying this a lot in this video because this video is about blockchain consensus theory. So here are five examples of consensus being used in a sentence. You and your friends don't know what to eat. You guys need to come to a consensus and agree on something. Government is passing a law. Well, the lawmakers need to come to consensus. Your parents got married. Technically, that is a consensus. Your family decided they wanted to vacation in Mexico. That is a consensus. Your parents divorce. That is a great example of consensus, but that's an example of it not working. Anyways, the complicated computer science of consensus algorithms and distributed systems like blockchains can teach us a lot about how to make robust, resilient, valuable networks that can support millions of people just like the internet. So in this video, we're going to have a deep dive into consensus, not just what is proof of stake or what is proof of work, but the actual theories of computer science behind it. So let's learn about the nerdy computer world of consensus algorithms. The first thing you need to know about consensus is that it is not a blockchain or crypto specific thing. Although I will be talking about consensus theory in relations to blockchains, consensus is a very old computer science topic. In this video, we're going to learn about traditional consensus protocols like Paxos and Raft, explain the five stages of consensus algorithms, Byzantine fault tolerance, civil resistance, the requirements that blockchains need for consensus, the theory behind consensus, and then have proof of work, proof of stake, and proof of authority models compared. And then finally, which blockchain consensus protocol is the best? These distributed systems of computation is basically the idea that, hey, we have all these computers that we want to connect together to focus on a certain task. And these basic ideas of how computers are networking is the basic idea of the internet and is why consensus is used everywhere besides just blockchains. Some examples of distributed computing that need consensus protocols are cloud computing like AWS, page ranks like what Google uses, clock synchronization which keeps all of our computers in sync on time, smart power grids which are computers that need to all communicate with each other in order to adequately supply power, and UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, the things from Black Ops 2, yeah, those need consensus protocols as well. The thing you need to understand about consensus protocols is that they're very important whenever you have lots of computers that are distributed and all need to communicate with each other for some sort of application. So let's learn about some consensus protocols, starting off with Paxos. Paxos was originally created in the 80s and revised in the 90s, and that's why there's lots of different versions. Fun fact about Paxos is that there's also a crypto project called Paxos, but the original name is a Greek island. And in typical computer science fashion, these computer scientists named this consensus protocol after the fictional island of Paxos where they would imagine this democratic system would take place. And there are other consensus protocols made around this time, but Paxos and Raft work something like this. So there's a network of computers and each individual dot is called a node which represents a single computer. This is a gross oversimplification because Paxos is complicated and has all these edge cases and I don't want to spend all day talking about them. So let's go through the stages. You have a proposal. So one node will send out information to the other nodes. It sends out information and then it goes on to the next stage, which is acknowledgement, which means all the computers acknowledge this information. And the next stage is called a promise, which then the nodes say, yeah, we'll add this information. And the next stage is a commit, which means they actually add this information. So this is a multiple round process of it going through all these stages and there are ballots and it's complicated and that's why RAF introduced elections and leaders and it's just overall very complicated. The whole idea is that computers had a very complex voting system in order to agree on the shared state of the network. And if you look at the chart, you realize one thing is that it is fault tolerant. Meaning that since the network relies on each other, if one node ends up going down, the whole network can keep on continuing. Overall, it makes the system more reliable and resistant, even if one third of the nodes happen to be down. It's like a mini democracy except for computers. So Paxos and RAF were very important breakthroughs and consensus, but had one problem. These were complicated systems that were only fault tolerant. 
which means, yeah, these nodes can go offline or crash, but assumes that these nodes are always honest. So these networks would get destroyed if there was a bad actor sharing malicious information. Imagine if you had a permissionless network that anyone can join and you just trusted people not to spread misinformation. This problem would make a new era of consensus protocols with something called Byzantine fault tolerance. Remember how I bugged you on how complicated Paxos was? Well, I wasn't kidding. It was so complicated that computer scientists wanted to make a more simpler consensus algorithm and one that's not just fault tolerant. This consensus algorithm laid down the groundworks for what modern blockchains use today. And this paper is PBFT by Miguel Castro and Barbara Liskov. PBFT stands for Byzantine Fault Tolerance and the P stands for Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance. And modern blockchain consensus derives from this exact same paper. PBFT was so amazing because it brought Byzantine fault tolerance and practicality to consensus. So let's learn about Byzantine fault tolerance or BFT. So, so far in the history of consensus, we have the organized distribution of trusted computers in a network. But in an open network like blockchains, you cannot make those trust assumptions. You have to assume that in this system, there are going to be malicious nodes. So Byzantine fault tolerant networks factor in any malicious nodes in the network. But how does Byzantine fault tolerant work? Well, in typical computer science faction, there's a fake historical example that explains a niche computer science scenario. Byzantine fault tolerance comes from the Byzantine general problem. So multiple Byzantine generals are at war and they're attacking the city. These generals can either all attack or all retreat. It doesn't matter what they do, they just have to come to an agreement and either attack or leave. This decision that they have to come to an agreement to is called a consensus. So they need to send messages to each other telling each other to retreat or attack, but also the Byzantine generals can't trust each other. These generals are spread across a city. So their messengers might die, their messengers might be bribed to send the wrong message, they might say they're going to attack but they're going to retreat. So the generals are in this very tricky scenario that the computer scientists are trying to portray. You need people to come to an agreement. Less than one third of the network can go offline or be unable to communicate. And they can't trust each other since some of them can act maliciously. So what system can we make to help the Byzantine Empire and these Byzantine generals? Well, we can make a Byzantine fault tolerant system. If one third of the nodes decide to act maliciously or go offline, the system is still secure and reliable. But there's a problem. For blockchains, they're not civil safe. Civil safe is another term that computer scientists made to describe another scenario. And it's called Sybil because of a book. In this book, there's a lady with multiple personalities. You can cheat these networks where multiple people have to come to an agreement by making a whole bunch of versions of yourself. The reason we want something to be Sybil safe is because in these networks where multiple people have to vote and agree on something, you can make multiple fake versions of yourself to cheat the system. Think of it like controlling a democracy by making a whole bunch of fake votes. Okay, okay, enough fake scenarios and consensus algorithms. How does this apply to blockchains? Consensuses that fit into blockchain technology need to meet all these criteria. It needs to be a distributed system of computation that agrees on a shared state. The system also needs to be Byzantine fault tolerant and resistant to malicious nodes. And on top of that, it needs to be civil safe and immune from fake nodes and their votes. So consensus protocols only work for blockchains if they have those properties. Funny you might say that because there are a lot of different consensuses for blockchains. And when I mean a lot, I mean a lot. You have proof of work, helium consensus, Nakamoto consensus, proof of weight, proof of activity, proof of space and time, proof of authority, proof of burn, proof of importance, and of course, proof of stake. But even that has multiple different flavors. Solana's proof of history with proof of stake, Algorand's pure proof of stake, EOS's delegated proof of stake, Avalanche's snowball proof of stake, and the list goes on and on. 90% of these you don't need to understand, and most blockchain consensus can be divided into three different categories. Fair, trustless, and efficient, but it's a trilemma, which means out of the three, you can only pick two at most. So although you may see a lot of different blockchain consensus, they all basically divide into proof of work, proof of stake, and federated consensus, or proof of authority. So let's start off with proof of work. In proof of work, nodes get rewarded for computational work. For example, Bitcoin uses proof of work, and in this system, Bitcoin miners solve complex math problems and get rewarded in Bitcoin. 
Proof of work is civil resistance because you have to put up computational work in order to get rewarded. And other computers use cryptography in order to check your work with something called a hash function. So once you solve a block and prove it with a hash function, then you get rewarded Bitcoin. Think of proof of work kind of like a race. Anyone can join this race and that's really nice, but at the end of the day, there's only one winner. So hundreds of people can participate in this race, but only one will win and the other ones don't get compensated and just waste all of their time and for Bitcoin, a lot of energy. So proof of work is fair and trustless, but not efficient. And this is why Bitcoin is notorious for its energy consumption. This is contrary to proof of stake. In proof of stake, nodes get rewarded for their work, but also get penalized since they have deposited a stake. The biggest example of proof of stake is now Ethereum. In Ethereum, you have to deposit 32 Ether in order to join the network. So once you've bought an in and put in your safety deposit, now you can do work on the network and get rewarded for that work. But if you pass any malicious blocks, then you will get penalized and slashed. The best way to think about proof of stake is like the NBA. You and four of your friends can join the NBA, but you have to buy a team slot. Technically, anyone who has the money can join the NBA, but not everyone has money laying around. So overall in the system, it isn't the fairest, but you get the best people playing for the NBA. These people are personally invested into the league and overall makes a greater show. The way proof of stake is civil resistance is because the only people who can join the network have to put up money first. So overall, proof of stake is trustless and efficient, but not the fairest. And next we have federated consensus, or you probably know as proof of authority. In proof of authority, nodes are chosen and rewarded for their work. And the biggest example of proof of authority is Binance Smart Chain. Binance is a centralized company, which means they choose who validates the Binance Smart Chain. The best example of proof of authority is authoritarian governments like oligarchs. Technically, you can become an oligarch, but you have to be in the inner circle first. So overall, proof of authority is efficient and fair, but not trustless. So which consensus protocol is the best? I'll give you the theoretical answer and then the real world answer. Philosophically and in theory, all these consensus protocols each have their own pros and cons. And there is no clear answer since none of these are all trustless, fair, and efficient. People who support proof of work will argue that in proof of stake, only the rich get richer and it's just unfair for people who can't put up money. And the people who argue for a proof of authority and federated consensus, which basically is no one, argue that trust in a system and in the real world is basically inevitable. And all of these systems have some level of trust since in order to join the network, you first have to download block history from someone else. Pro proof of stakers will argue that although it isn't the fairest system because of the money barrier, it's efficient and trustless, and it isn't a giant waste of electricity. So that is the theoretical answer, but theory doesn't always align with the real world. So the real answer is proof of stake is the best system. And proof of stake wins by a landslide. Proof of stake makes it an even playing field because no matter how much money you have, you get the exact same yield. And with Bitcoin and economies of scale, the people who end up controlling the system are the ones who can afford the most computation and the cheapest electricity. So only the rich get access to cheap electricity and computation because of economies of scale and them buying it in bulk. And for proof of authority, it's kind of pointless because these things are supposed to be trustless and decentralized. And if you wanted centralized technologies, they already exist. It's called traditional finance and web too. So the general consensus around blockchain and crypto is that proof of stake wins. And hopefully you learned a lot from this video. We went over what is consensus, raft and Paxos, the stages, Byzantine fault tolerance, civil safe, blockchain consensus, blockchain consensus theory, and the three major blockchain consensus. So if you learned something from this video and you want to learn more, make sure to subscribe and follow my Twitter at go go Diego crypto right there. Or you can just scan this QR code. And as always, thank you for watching. Oh wow, you made it to the end of the video. Congratulations. Uh, what the hell? I certainly had a lot of fun learning about consensus protocols. I thought I was just gonna make a quick video. It was more than that. This video probably took me around 20 to 30 hours to complete. And uh, I realized one beautiful thing about consensus protocols is that I was looking through these papers, through the 80s, through the 90s, and they're all trying to solve this, this consensus problem of just a general agreement. And I realized one thing, is that the problems that computer scientists are trying to solve are the problems that 
have always plagued man. Just the organization of humans is really hard. And consensus protocols are only the organization of computers. It's really nice to think about Greek politicians 2,000 years ago had the exact same problems that we have now. Although these are new problems and new technologies, it's really all the same. Anyways, a little food for thought. And I almost forgot, I need an outro. And if this video gets 1,000 likes, I'll drink this glass of milk.